Hello, and welcome to the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, Nevada. Right now, our museum galleries are empty, but there's still a lot of historical stories to share. And that's why I'm very excited to welcome you today to a tour of the Mob Museum. We focus on the history of organized crime and law enforcement and its impact on American society. And the building that we're standing in right now is a part of that story. We are in the Mob Museum's lobby, and this building is on the National Register of Historic Places. It was the original federal courthouse and post office here in Las Vegas, and that's why you can see these post office boxes right behind me. Uh, the building was completed in 1933. It was done in the neoclassical style, and it's very much a part of the organized crime story. So we're really excited to have you join us, and I can't wait to show you everything that the museum has to offer. Our tour begins in the lineup, which is exactly where the story of many young mobsters began as well. Beginning in the 1800s, police precincts began using lineups to identify criminal suspects. A group of men or women would be paraded into the precinct and lined up behind one-way glass. Then the victim of a crime would be asked to identify who in the lineup committed the crime. In this way, many mobsters found themselves behind one-way glass many times in their young lives. 100 years ago, on January 17, 1920, the United States began enforcing the 18th Amendment, more commonly known as Prohibition. This meant that for 13 years, the United States was dry. You couldn't make, sell, or transport alcohol anywhere in the United States or from overseas into the United States. This was 100 years in the making. Beginning around the 1820s and 30s, temperance advocates began suggesting that the United States should become dry in order to make the nation healthier, wealthier, and safer. That's not exactly what happened. During Prohibition, mobsters made millions. And around the country, as mobsters vied to have the most successful rum running and bootlegging rackets, violent turf wars broke out. I'm now standing in front of one of the premier artifacts here at the Mob Museum. This brick wall is a representation of the sobering reality of violent turf wars that broke out during Prohibition as mobsters vied to make millions. Against this brick wall, on February 14, 1929, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre occurred. You can still see some of the bullet holes from that massacre. As the members of the gang waited for their meeting, two police officers came to the door of the garage. They allowed the police officers in, thinking that they would be arrested on some sort of low-level bootlegging charges. They were lined up against this brick wall, and instead, two more men pulled out Tommy guns and a shotgun, and the men were shot execution style right there against this wall. Six of the seven men died at the scene, and the seventh survived for a few hours at an area hospital before dying later that day. The crime to this day remains unsolved, although it's pretty clear to everyone that it was their main rivals, Al Capone's Southside Gang, who committed the massacre. As I mentioned before, you can see some of the bullet holes here on the wall. I think it's important to note that this is not blood, it is red paint, and it was added by a previous owner who toured this wall across the country. Besides the brick wall from the massacre, we also have a number of pieces of evidence from the massacre in our collection. This case highlights some of the bullets and shotgun shells that were found at the scene of the crime, as well as Cook County Coroner's report. Part of the reason that we have this evidence on display is that it never went into the custody of the Chicago Police Department. Witnesses said that the assailants were dressed in police uniforms, so there was concern by Chicago citizenry that the police were involved. Instead, the Cook County coroner hired Calvin Goddard, who was considered the father of forensic ballistics and was a well-known and well-regarded forensic examiner across the United States. He came to Chicago to try to identify the firearms used in the massacre. By comparing bullets with bullet comparison microscopes and looking at the rifling patterns on those bullets, he was able to rule out police involvement. But he still didn't know exactly who committed the crime until a few months later when they were able to uh, collect guns from a man named Fred Killer Burke, a well-known hitman in the area. They discovered that the bullets were fired from Tommy guns that belonged to him. After the end of Prohibition in 1933, the United States had a few challenges. For many Americans, they believed that federal agents were ineffectual as it had been a challenge for them to combat organized crime during Prohibition. The director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, 
really didn't like that the American public saw federal agents as ineffectual, and he really championed the idea that American children revere and respect law enforcement. Enter the G-Men and Dick Tracy toys. That's what we've got here in this display case. And you can see a number of popular toys. There were G-Men uh, toy guns. There were G-Men comic books and uh, little books. Even badges made for children to play cops and robbers and pretend that they were the good guys. This is a ticket from one of the most infamous examples of sports fixing, the 1919 World Series, when the Chicago White Sox conspired to throw the game against the Cincinnati Reds. Famed mobster Arnold Rothstein is considered to have orchestrated this scandal, although to this day historians debate his role in it. As lucrative rackets turned small-time crooks into millionaires, mobsters had a lot of ample cash, and they used it to buy a lot of luxury goods. This case, which we refer to as the bling case, shows off some of those objects. Up here, you can see sunglasses that belong to Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. He wore them as he gallivanted around Southern California and Nevada. Down here, you can see a miniature lighter that Frank Sinatra gave out to his friends and special guests when he owned a share in the Calneva Lodge at Lake Tahoe. And over here, we have a diamond-encrusted golf ball marker that mobster Mo Dalitz used when he played the Lynx here in Las Vegas. 